of the last you know, 12 months of data that we have now. Um, and when we had the data that we looked at, our analysts and, and Paul's staff down here and his resource evaluation team and our team down in commercial, you know, they were looking at the data that they did have and they were running their analysis on that data. And when you, when you looked at that data and you combined what that data looked like with what was going on in the marketplace, right? The price had just dropped less than a year before by almost half. We saw early indications that producers on the North Slope were cutting their capital expenditures, right? We, we now have the final numbers for 2016. It was, in fact, a 44% reduction in capital expenditures on the North Slope. We saw new ar news articles that rigs were being laid down, and we saw articles and, and media outlets reporting all over the world that, that the entire industry was, was collapsing. It was co constrained, right? It was, um, it was pulling back on a lot of investment. So with the data we had and with the um, expectation of what we saw around us, we were really skeptical that without drilling more wells and without more investment that the producers would be able to maintain the rate that they were um, or that they would be able to increase it, right? We were very, we were very skeptical. In fact, um, when we talked to the producers, we, we didn't really believe even what they were telling us what they were going to be able to do. Um, when we actually started seeing the numbers come in, and even when I was sitting here in, in March, we had seen actual numbers starting to come in, and it was indicating that maybe there was something wrong in our forecast. And I believe I told you all that we would look at those numbers and we would incorporate them into our analysis, and we'd come back in the fall and we would see what that looked like. So here we are. And it, it wasn't just that our forecast was overly pessimistic. It was taking the data that was available at the time and doing the best that we could with it, right? And um, in fact, what we ended up seeing was that the operators, not only did they prove us wrong and, and outperform our expectations, but they actually outperformed their own expectations. So this slide here is um, the blue bars representing what the state was forecasting, the red bar representing what the operators told us that they were going to do. Um, and then the kind of tan bar representing the actual production that came in. And you can see that, that the actual numbers came in even higher than what the operators thought they were going to be able to do. Uh, Red Man Kawasaki. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Thanks, Ed, for being here today. Um, I'm, I pulled up the uh, 2016 fall uh, forecast when we were here last. Um, I guess it, it wasn't published until December, but that you changed the way that you did the production forecast and you just explained how you um, you calculated the volumes under development, you looked at um, volumes from projects that were under evaluation and that, the, I mean, essentially the lesson learned was that it wasn't a predictive model. So are you saying that the model is flawed or that the model has to be refined going forward? Representative Kawasaki through the chair. Oh. Paul will talk a little bit more about the methodological changes that have happened in this past year. But even, remember that last year was the first year that DNR took over the forecast. And so when we did take over the forecast, we made a couple of changes in ourselves in the way that we were doing the forecast versus what the, what the uh, consultants were doing before that. And part of the forecast model that was built by, by our analysts down in the Division of Oil and Gas incorporated some economic testing, right? It wanted, we wanted to make sure that the wells that were being drilled, the projects that were being developed were actually going to turn a profit before we plugged them into the model and, and made them go. What we, one of the things that we realized was that once these projects and wells have kind of been sanctioned by the, by the companies, it, they tend to go ahead and go ahead and do them, even if they're not. So our, our model that we built last year was a little bit ambitious in, in, in trying to predict what the operator behavior was going to be and pulling back on capital. Um, now we're starting to see that not only, you know, was that probably a little bit aggressive, but the operators are actually able to find ways to improve efficiencies within their existing assets as well. And in that low price environment, that was very important for them to be able to do, and they were able to do that. So I wouldn't say that our model was necessarily flawed. I would say it's an evolution, and we did go back and look at some of the, the issues where we, we missed a little bit in the last forecast, and we made adjustments accordingly. Thank you, Mr. Further questions at this point? Uh, Representative Gred. Uh, thank you, Mr. Kutcher. Um, you mentioned that you guys had just taken over the, the forecasting. Um, how often in the past did the consultants, um, how often in the past would the actuals outperform the forecast? 
in previous years. If I can jump to a, a future slide, I can answer that question for you. Um, So I actually plotted all of the forecasts versus the actuals before last year. And what you'll see is in all of those cases where the dot is above the zero line are cases where the consultant had forecast higher than what the actual production came in at. And a lot of the reason why these over forecasts were happening was because the, the consultants were looking at future projects that were under development or under evaluation, and they included those projects into their forecast. And then something would happen, you know, a permit would get delayed or a schedule would slip or a project would, would not happen for various reasons. They couldn't find investors. For whatever reason, those projects that they were looking at and projecting into the future didn't manifest. And so there was this consistent bias where the consultants were providing us forecasts that just didn't come to fruition. So we took, starting five years ago, when I first started at the Department of Revenue, we started taking this approach of trying to back that out, try to, um, try to implement a little bit of res risking methodology to, to not, we, it was unreasonable to think everything was going to be perfect and everything was going to work out exactly like everybody wanted it to. But it's also unreasonable to say that none of those projects are going to happen. So we were trying to figure out a way that we could forecast somewhere in the middle so that we were, we were probability weighting those, those future possible outcomes. And that's, that's what we're seeing here. And, and uh, Paul will talk more about that later, if that's OK. Did I answer your question? You did, yeah. Perfect. Thank you. And before you proceed, I want to recognize Representative Johnson has joined us. Welcome. So, Paul Decker, for the record, if we can uh, jump back to slide 10, I believe. Um, specifically on the question of what have we done that's different in this forecast than in last year's forecast. And as Ed mentioned, you know, this is only our second run through this, and uh, it's not as if there's a canned methodology out there uh, that would be applicable. So we've, we've been refining, you know, building and refining our, uh, our process, and so that's something I want to emphasize. But for the most part, our process uh, adopted last year was pretty robust, pretty sound. We have identified certain things that needed to be changed, and we'll go through those. Um, both, both times, we generated an official 10-year forecast. Um, but if you look at last year's forecast, what you'll see is that uh, we treated future projects that were not anticipated to yield first oil for at least five years. We treated those in a separate category entirely outside of the forecast, and we just sort of uh, slangily referred to that as the pot of gold, things that you'd like to find happening, uh, but they're somewhat elusive, somewhat speculative. So that, that name was kind of appropriate. But again, that was excluded outside the official forecast. Uh, so a lot of the major projects that we're hoping to see were not in that, that long-term forecast last year. This year, we lengthened that at revenue's request. And just because it's a sound idea, really. Uh, we lengthened that outlook to 10 years, and we've taken steps to include all those projects that are out there identified uh, as somebody with a champion that, that they're working on uh, in that under-evaluation subcategory two. So we'll, we'll speak about the, the categories. Um, another change is that last year we presented the forecast with no seasonality adjustment to it, uh, no sine wave effect that, that reflects the very profound uh, 60 or 70,000 barrel a day swings between higher winter rates with good efficiency due to compression efficiencies and uh, the lower rates overall that you see in the summer, especially because of major maintenance turnaround events and shut-ins. So that was a really important thing that we were not, we just naively didn't anticipate the, the focus on the month-to-month -month, uh, forecast last year. So we, we took steps and have introduced that seasonality adjustment. Um, also, a learning uh, from last year was just, again, this close scrutiny of the very near term. Where are we today compared to the last month of actual uh, or, you know, the next month of the forecast? And that sort of month-by-month -month scrutiny. So um, I think it's fair to say that in the past we'd been thinking in terms of the long-term over-predictions that, that we saw in so many forecasts and how to mitigate that. Uh, with the benefit of what we learned last year by the School of Hard Knocks, we've, we've uh, sort of really focused our attention now on the near-term, uh, improving that near-term prediction without sacrificing uh, the, the reality of the long-range outlook to, to the maximum degree possible. Um, 
And last year, a, a detail here, that some of the under-evaluation projects, in other words, the projects that are not yet fully sanctioned, that are a year or more out in the future, uh, we did not apply a risk for the chance of occurrence of those projects. We, we counted them essentially at full face value last year. This year, um, including uh, all those projects that are more than one year out, uh, we, we took a hard look at uh, risking those for the chance that they will actually happen during the 10-year forecast window, number one, and then also developing sort of a, an estimate of uh, what's the soonest this project might happen, what's a, real, uh, a realistic delay that we might see on a project of this sort, and so that was based on uh, personal you know, experience that we have within the division as well as uh, analysis of statistics about how long it's taken from, uh, you know, discovery to development uh, for North Slope fields especially. So, so b before you go on, uh, will Representative Pruitt and then Kawasaki? Yeah, thank you. So, uh, in trying to understand then, would a Armstrong, for example, in their, in, in their project, is that something that is included in this and and is that why we also see uh, I mean there's a huge change from the 500 if I look if I go farther and, and look it's it's we see a steady 500,000 in that range uh, for the next 10 years as opposed to last year it was it was more around 300,000 at, at that same time frame um, it is it's this is probably why we're seeing that, and, and it sounds like maybe Armstrong included in that could be a part of that. And if you could just kind of speak to that. Through the chair, uh, Representative Pruitt, I think you're exactly right that last year, the way we excluded projects that were at least five years out and said those are all pretty darn speculative, we're not going to include that in the, in the official forecast. Um, therefore, the official forecast would, would look more pessimistic last year in that five and plus year range. So you're exactly right that a lot of the flattening we see in the out years of this year's forecast have to do with inclusion of some of those long-term, what we call under-evaluation subcategory two. Uh, follow up, Reverend Yeah, and uh, I mean, obviously we, um, I mean, last year there was concern because I, it didn't look like we were looking at a realistic going forward. But I also think that the other issue we're trying to deal with was was valid. I mean, we were looking out, and there were times where we were overestimating, and it was a it was a continued problem for us as we were trying to to um, look out. Uh, is your confidence that we may have hit that middle that I think everyone was looking for us, which is really closer to what we can utilize as our our estimate? Um, is your confidence pretty strong that um, by including an Armstrong, which is a is, which is a massive project, and 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 so far still early in the stages, that that is you're comfortable. I mean, not just because you were told from, from revenue wanted to force you to, but you're very comfortable yourselves as DNR including that in in this uh, uh, forecast going forward. Through the chair, Representative Pruitt, I would say that uh, I'm comfortable that we've significantly improved the forecast in the way we're handling these long-range projects now. Um, time will tell whether, you know, our risking has been appropriate or our estimates of start date and the spread around start date have been uh, correct. So I, I feel like what we're seeing, um, and we'll, we'll talk about this more later, that the outcome that you'll see for some of these long-range project, projects uh, in the forecast, any one project is probably looking different in our forecast than the way that actual scenario would plan out or play out. What we're doing is really a portfolio management exercise. And so what we're trying to do is come up with the best risk-weighted outcome for the entire portfolio, as opposed to trying to predict the exact uh, performance of individual stocks in the portfolio, if that makes sense. So. Governor Kawasaki. Thank you, Mr. Chairman. Um, so for the methodology, I asked the question a little bit earlier dealing with um, the capital expenditures and how those are related to um, future project outlooks. Um, so where exactly is that in the new methodology when it comes to predicting um, future production? Representative Kawasaki, through the chair, the, the economics is, is, I'm sorry, this is Ed King for the record. Uh, 
Um, the, the economics is, so Paul's team down in resource evaluation really looks at the, the, the resource itself and the profiles that it could generate. We also have a commercial team in Div Division of Oil and Gas that, that does things like economic analysis. And we have a, an analyst down there, um, Pascal Umekwe, who did a lot of the, or all of the work on the, the economics that are associated with this. What we did prior to last year, there was never really an economic test whatsoever on whether a project or a well would be included into the forecast. Last year, we incorporated that economic analysis, at least in some level, uh, for the first time. And that economic analysis still is in the model today. It's just not as heavily weighted on projects in the near term. It's still, the, a project has to pass the, the, the economic tests in order to be included in the forecast. So when we have that price sensitivity and you end up with an iteration in a low price environment, if the project doesn't work, then it doesn't get included. So that, that's kind of how we're, we're dealing with the economic issue of including forecasts based on, or including projects in the forecast based on their economics. And if you want to dig deeper into that conversation, I'd like to invite Pascal to talk with you. Follow-up, um, follow Jim <coughs> Kawasaki. I, I guess, because you know, when we're talking about capital expenditures and investments that the, the um, producers are making on, in the fields, it doesn't look like there's any link to production increases and capital expenditures in the previous year. Yeah. Representative Kawasaki through the chair. Uh, it is kind of interesting. The, the production doesn't really come in in the same year that the investments are being made, which, is, which really makes it difficult. So part of what you're seeing here, especially in the alpine fields, is production from CD5. Well, that, those capital expenditures were actually happening in 2013, 14, and early 15 before the production came in in November of 2015 and, and is still continuing to come on as they drill wells today. So the it isn't, in time at least, it isn't a direct correlation. It's at least a lagged correlation between the investment and and the production. But what, what we were saying is that when we see when we see capital expenditures fall like they did in 2016, then what we were expecting is that in some future year, that's going to result in a reduction in production relative to if that investment were to happen. So that's why we were fairly pessimistic when we saw that, that capital expenditures started to fall like that, that we'd be able to sustain that rate. The operators really have done an amazing job with what they're doing. They found ways to do more with less and to survive in this low price environment. But so, Mr. Chairman, uh, Represent Kawasaki. So, so like you said, there is a lag time between the time in which capital expenditure is sunk into the field versus the production timeline. If we've got a low 2016 year and a low 2017 capital expenditure year, don't you expect that to drop at some future point, maybe four or five years down the road? And then why isn't that reflected in the production forecast? And, and Representative Kawasaki through the chair. So I think that if we were to continue to see the $4 billion investment that we saw you know, in the years prior, in 2015 and 14, then we would see an even higher increase in production from those new projects. What we aren't seeing is those increases in production. So when those projects that we're talking about, like the Pickas and the, and the other projects, the Willows, when those do start going into development, we're going to first see an increase in capital expenditures. What we're seeing right now is that those expenditures aren't really happening other than at GMT-1 and at um, MoosePad and at H1 News. Those are reflected in this $2 billion number, which are resulting in increases in production. What we, what we were worried about is that this dramatic shift in product in capital expenditures was going to do exactly what you were what you're referring to and that's why our production forecast last year reflected that that sentiment now that we've have 12 more months of data and and as representative Pert was was talking about that that really changes kind of the trajectory of the decline if we you know we had 20 years of five percent decline and then all of a sudden we had one data point where we had zero percent that didn't really change our minds too much mm -hmm. but now we have two so it pivots our idea a little bit. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Yeah, thank you. Um, and before we go to Representative Guttenberg, I, I've been wanting to ask, you know, where we're talking about these under evaluation and risking those, when we have a project that um, hasn't been fully sanctioned, what kind of a risk evaluation is that? 
okay, we've got six projects. We've got a 50% likelihood that each one, that any one of these or each one of them will, and then as they get some capitalization and it's only one year or two years out, then it's an 80% probability it's going to go forward. But if it's not getting capitalized, then it is going to go down into 30% risk is that the kind of risking that we're talking about in these evaluations mr. chair I would I would say yes in general you're correct you know we have uh, the ability to risk each project independently of the others in its category number one so yes and uh, and certainly you know each year we will make that assessment uh, assuming we continue with this line of methodology here we'd make the assessment project by project and see what has happened in the year previous uh, that would modify the, the risk factor, the timing of occurrence or, or the chance of occurrence. So the, as well as the resource volumes uh, that we might expect, all those things would be reviewed on a year-to-year -year basis, right? So if you had one that was risk at 50%, meaning there's some things going forward and then nothing happens that next year, would that still stay at a 50% happening within five years? Uh, kind of thing, or it would just push the years out, or would that actually decrease the probability that it's going to ever occur? So I, I don't think we have hard and fast rules about exactly how to assign a chance factor or a risk factor to a, a project, but in my mind, that would certainly change the timing, right? If, if uh, a delay or a deferral of activity uh, was announced, that would certainly postpone the timing. and. Uh, may very well be an indicator as well that the project is not as likely to happen, so. If I could just add this as Ed King for the record. Uh, so in, in just so that it's very clear, we're, we aren't looking at a project and then saying, well, we think that that maybe has a 50% chance, so we're gonna cut its production in half. That's not quite what we're doing here. So what we're running is a, a Monte Carlo simulation that takes into account a very, a, a vast amount of different uncertainties. There's price uncertainty, there's volume uncertainty, there's timing uncertainty, there's a chance of, a, of occurrence that is exactly that. There are, there are multiple uncertainties that, that we aren't really sure about, so we put a distribution around them and then let the model kind of pick at random within those distributions different scenarios. And so you could think of it like what Paul was talking about with the stock, right? So if we think that our investment return might be 10% next year, but it might be zero and we're really not sure, we won't just say, well, let's split the difference. What we might do is run some scenarios, right? We might run 100,000 iterations and then pick the middle scenario. That's what we're doing here is we're picking that middle scenario. So it's not, it's not like we're making a subjective assessment over, well, that one should be 20% and that one should be 50. We're, we're actually, it's more involved and more technical than that. So the risk assessment is really a Monte Carlo model itself on, e on each project? Yes. Okay, thank you. Representative Guttenberg. Thank you, Mr. Chair. And um, gentlemen, thank you for the, the conversation. I really appreciate it. Um, you know, we're, look, we're looking at lessons learned here and we're talking about methodology and you kind of got to where I wanted. I mean, you're looking at this chart. You wouldn't say to cut CapEx another 44% with increased production higher either, right? So, um, you know, many times uh, members, uh, people in Alaska and members and people in this building think um, the outcome of a production or a facility or a plan is entirely based on things that happened in Alaska, whether it's our tax rates or credits or um, uh, just that everything we do determines everything that happens. And I think it, it ignores um, uh, international markets, international competing projects, the change of going to gas, alternative energies. Um, you know, you talked about um, forecasting using seasonal, uh, the expectations, major maintenance, even though it, the oil is flowing easier in the, in the summer, they're also doing major maintenance and shutting down. There's storms in Valdez, there's tanker capacity, there's, I mean, the list just goes on. But how many of the international things that we have no um, uh, um, impact on that we, can, we control, whether it's in their corporate boardroom or fields being overseas, um, uh, affects what your methodology is. I mean, you don't go down into that minutia here, and but on um, on slide six, you have a wave in your 10-year forecast, 
And I'm wondering if that has anything in the high estimate, wonder if that has anything to do with any of those things that are going on um, that we don't know about. Representative Gutenberg, through the chair, I, I think a lot of what you're talking about with the international markets really manifests itself in what amounts to the price forecast. So if you know more supply comes on from the Middle East or supply comes offline because of a war or whatever, we're going to feel those ripples through the change in price. And when, when a corporation that, that operates in Alaska is making a decision to invest in Alaska, it's going to be a, a product of what their price expectations are, what their profit expectations are, what their opportunities are here and elsewhere, and, and comparing all of those things. So I, I, I mean, I, I appreciate the point that we don't have control, or at least complete control over the entire marketplace, but we do have some control over some of the things that they do take into consideration. And if I may, Mr. Chair. Representative Guttenberg. And, and I don't want to get down into it, but just, just a general conversation of how many of those things besides price do you figure into the methodology? Representative Guttenberg through there, we, we don't try to okay. uh, forecast international markets. We just, we do appreciate the uncertainty in price, and we assume that that un price uncertainty captures all of those other uncertainties. Okay, and just, oh, sorry, Mr. Chair, just to follow through. So the previous forecasters, did they do any of that? Did that figure into anything? I, Representative Guttenberg through the chair, I really can't speak for the previous forecasters, but I, I would, I would guess that they probably did not. Okay. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, thank you. And before we go for, further, uh, Representative Wilson, are you still online with us? And did you have any questions at this point? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. Mr. Chairman, I do have a question. Okay, go ahead. Uh, could you please speak 